uh, to uh, any college that uh, had ROTC to which I could get admitted. And in high school, I thought I wanted to be an environmental scientist. I, I um, uh, led, our, I was, I'm an Eagle Scout and uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the outdoors and, and uh, and those were the days of the fledging environmental movement. In fact, I was the uh, leader of our high school's Earth Day celebration in uh, 1970. So I was looking for uh, colleges that had strong environmental science, uh, wildlife biology, forestry, those kinds of things. And okay. uh, my uh, search focused on Cornell and Michigan and Purdue. And uh, I was lucky enough to get into all three and I visited all three campuses. Now re remember, this was uh, the uh, spring of 1970, and uh, the, the ferment that was uh, uh, abroad in the land at that time, and, and so uh, a part of what figured into the calculation was uh, I wanted to uh, go to a school where the uh, ROTC uh, students weren't literally being spat upon. I mean, literally, at Cornell in Michigan, the, uh, the ROTC uh, cadets uh, 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 never appeared in public in uh, uniform, uh, uh, didn't cut their hair or any of those kinds of things. But here's what really cinched the deal for me to go to Purdue. When I visited Purdue, and now in all these years of, uh, you know, of being on the Purdue board, I understand why I was such a hot commodity. Uh, I was an out-of-state student and I was on full scholarship, so uh, they really rolled out the red carpet for me uh, at Purdue. I had quite a quite a uh, on-campus tour. Went out there by myself without my folks, and uh, because I was going to be spending a lot of time at the Lilly Hall of Life Sciences, they took me over there. And then we had a lunch break, and we were on our own for lunch. And so I cr walked across State Street into what I thought was a fraternity, because I didn't know anything about the Greek alphabet. The Greek letters were Pi, Beta, Phi. It was a sorority. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I knocked on the door and walked in, and this gorgeous young woman greeted me, and I introduced myself and said why I was on campus, and that I really wanted to see, you know, what a fraternity was like, she laughed and she said, well, this isn't a fraternity, it's a sorority, uh, but it's lunchtime, you're welcome to come in and have lunch with us. So I walked into this, uh, you know, dining hall at the Pi Phi house, and I was uh, introduced, and I was treated like uh, visiting royalty. Uh, and you can imagine a 17-year-old high school senior uh, having a couple hundred uh, beautiful young women uh, greet, greet him that way. And then invite you for dining. Uh, that sealed the deal. <laughs> right. There's a lot of social activities, right? <laughs> okay. Then continue on. So then uh, you, you came to Purdue. Where did, where, was your, where did you live and did you, were you in a fraternity or tell us a little about life at Purdue. I, in my freshman year, um, I was at McCutcheon Hall uh, and uh, was kind of focused on uh, trying to get uh, uh, oriented to Purdue. Fortunately, I had had a very strong high school uh, background, and so I did well, really well my freshman uh, year. Uh, that, uh, declined, <laughs> that declined over time, uh, but uh, uh, I uh, was deeply involved in ROTC and uh, those activities. and. Um, and also um, uh, an organization called Pershing Rifles, which uh, is a military uh, fraternity. Um, and um, uh, I was also uh, uh, a disc jockey on the McCutcheon Hall uh, radio station. Okay. Um, and uh, played uh, intramural sports. Okay. Um, but my father uh, had been uh, an, an SAE at Sigma Alpha Epsilon, a little college in Michigan, and so really about the only uh, fraternity that uh, I could have gone into was the uh, SAE house and in 1970-71 the SAE house was just right on the uh, brink of being uh, uh, decertified or whatever happens to it they were they were in such sad shape uh, so I did not I did not join a Greek letter uh, fraternity and I think uh, to this day uh, that's something that my father uh, regrets however to jump ahead in the story when uh, our son uh, attended Purdue, he joined the SAE house, so all was right with the universe. Okay, sounds good. Did you come for a day on campus? Did they have that when you were um, starting in? Uh, 
point at? Well, I, I spent a day on campus, okay. uh, Catherine. I, I don't recall okay. what its nomenclature was right. in the spring right. of, uh, of 19. Okay, I'm sorry about orientation. You know, they have that in the summer uh, when, when, for the new students. Um, Actually, uh, I, I got a much better uh, orientation because uh, I, I neglected to mention that I, I played in the band uh, uh, freshman year. Okay. And uh, in the marching band. So, uh, gosh, we probably showed up two or three weeks early. That's right. They do have the practice before classes start. Yeah. Okay. That but was an excellent, uh, excellent um, orientation all by itself to be on campus like that. Sure. Before everybody arrived and to meet the upperclassmen in the band and, and they helped uh, with the orientation process. And I met a girl in the uh, uh, who's a fellow freshman in the band, but that's another whole story. We, we we don't need to talk about that. Okay. So, now, did you stay in McCutcheon the whole time, Bill, or uh, what was your residence? And then talk. Let me talk about your course of study while you're here, and any professors as well. Uh, I um, no. I spent my freshman year uh, in McCutcheon, and then moved off campus and okay. Uh, okay. and lived uh, in several different. Uh, uh, almost rat-infested, uh, you know, student housing kind of thing because uh, trying to do things on, on the cheap. So, yeah, I, I um, um, had, you know, various roommates uh, throughout the years and lived in various uh, places trying to get uh, ever, ever cheaper sure. uh, places to uh, live. Were there, there weren't as many apartments at that time. Were there, Bill, as there are today? That apartment true. Uh, complexes that have been built? Yeah, these were all, all I, I didn't live in any, what you would call an apartment house. I okay. Lived in the uh, student ghetto housing uh, right off campus. Okay. Uh, you know, where these old homes had been busted up into apartments. Apartments, that's right, I understand. Okay. Uh, any, uh, and what was your major? Well, I, I started off as a uh, uh, sort of a wildlife biology forestry uh, major, uh, and uh, uh, by the time well, uh, let, let me let me try to summarize what happened for over my freshman and sophomore years. But um, over, over the course of that time, Catherine, I became uh, much more sort of politically conscious, uh, aware of uh, of the war in Vietnam. Had long conversations with my father, who served in combat in Vietnam, about the war and about whether uh, I, it was really right for me to. Uh, Become an officer in the United States Army, given the questions and concerns I had uh, about the war. So by the time of the end of my sophomore uh, year, well, really by the by the time sophomore year rolled around, I had pretty much made the decision that I was going to withdraw from ROTC. Uh, and that process, my sophomore year, was really probably one of the worst years of my life in the sense of all that was going on uh, with uh, the war and me being an ROTC, and uh, ultimately I decided to withdraw, having been assured that I could withdraw at the end of the so my sophomore year, but uh, uh, a new fellow came in as the head of uh, the ROTC program uh, at, at Purdue, and he was a fellow that my father had actually relieved of command in Vietnam uh, for cowardice, and he decided that he was going to make an example out of me and actually uh, convene basically a court-martial uh, process uh, to try to get me to uh, go into the Army as, a, uh, as an enlisted man. Huh. Uh, and uh, we had a trial, and uh, last a couple of days, uh, there was a, a, the, inc the, 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 the legal kind of the legal question of, that was before uh, the body was whether I had uh, defrauded uh, the government out of the two years of uh, tuition and whatnot that I had um, misrepresented my uh, uh, intentions at the beginning. And this is much more than you probably ought to know, but it, it figures into the sort of the chronology of what happened. Okay. Anyway, yeah. the, uh, the, the panel that was convened uh, uh, didn't even go into deliberations. They ruled immediately kind of from, from the bench that I had no intention uh, to uh, defraud and that I was uh, free to go. Okay. By the time my sophomore year at Purdue uh, concluded, um, I was pretty estranged from Purdue. Uh, and had uh, I decided I was going to take a semester off, and, and I did. I I um, took the fall of uh, 1972 uh, off 
traveled around the country following the presidential campaign from college campus to college campus, and I was submitting uh, the uh, columns back to the exponent. That's how I got connected up to the exponent was yeah. doing these columns from the road. Okay. And while on the road in the fall of 1972, uh, I had decided I really wanted to go into journalism. My first love was journalism and um, stopped at Northwestern and uh, secured a transfer to Northwestern to go into the Medill School of Journalism. When I went back to Purdue um, at the end of uh, 1972 to get my ducks in a row to transfer to Northwestern, the exponent told me that they uh, wanted me to think about uh, becoming the editor uh, of the exponent, uh, which was an elective position. And basically the group uh, at the exponent uh, uh, saw something in me that, 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 that they liked and they told me that if I came back to Purdue in January of 73, that in that spring, um, they thought they could get the votes together to elect me uh, the editor of the exponent. So I went back to Purdue, um, and, and that occurred. I, I, I was elected editor okay. of the exponent. Now, the, of course, journalism doesn't, ex doesn't exist as a program. Did you uh, get it about communication? Would that have been your major then, or did you change majors when you came back? Actually, I picked up the same uh, major uh, that, uh, that, that, that that spring. Okay. Back into the, the same kind of uh, science and, and uh, entomology and dendrology and all these ologies because I had this this science orientation. But uh, when uh, when I was uh, elected the uh, uh, editor of the exponent. Uh, and I was I, I was in the ag school uh, in, in those days, and uh, ultimately graduated from the ag school. Mm -hmm. I'll explain in a moment. The dean of the uh, uh, ag school, uh, Dick Coles, um, uh, upon learning that one, uh, you know an ag ag uh, student had been elected editor of the Exponent, summoned me over to his big office in ag hall, and proceeded to absolutely read me the riot act about what a horrible paper the exponent was that it wasn't it, you know it wasn't worth lining a birdcage with uh, that it you know aspired to be this muckraking student newspaper when in fact what students really cared about was you know engagements and pinnings and social events and that sort of thing and that he felt uh, embarrassed that uh, somebody from the ag school uh, would be the editor of such a rag hmm said, well, Dean, there's one way to solve that, and uh, I'll withdraw from the ag school. I'll, I'll transfer over to HITSE, well, you know, then the School of Humanities, Social Sciences, and Education. He said, fine, I don't want you in the ag school. Uh, so I, I went straight from uh, that meeting and went down to, uh, the, uh, to do a, a CODO, and, and uh, who was there but the legendary Dave Fendler. Is that a name that's gotten on your list? I love to have, he's, pa yes, but he's passed away, though. Right, but yeah. I'm sure you've heard about him. Yes, oh, I recognize, and of course it was nice they named that hall after him. Oh. Yeah, he, the Fendler Hall. When he they was, uh, he was, he uh, was. Yes, many people have mentioned, uh, Bill, about him. So, I would love to have been, had the opportunity. So I, I went up to the uh, little clerk's desk there, and and apparently there was some, some uh, protocol that whenever anybody came up to try to get out of the ag school, that Dean Fendler was to be summoned. And he took me into his office and I told him this story and he said, well, with all due respect to the Dean, he's wrong, it's, a, it's an honor uh, to, uh, for our school to have the editor of the Exponent. He said, I'll cut you a deal. Uh, you stay in the Ag School, I'll let you take whatever you want to take. Uh, you can take all the history and political science, you can take anything you want, but I want you to graduate from the School of Agriculture take whatever you want and you and I'll work this out together and I said well great well what will be my major and he said well I'll tell you what we've got this uh, new major called agricultural communications and uh, it's it's so it's such a fledgling program that I have the authority basically to, to let you take whatever you want and you'll you'll get a, a degree so I have what's called, I have a Bachelor of Science in call, something called Agricultural Communication. Okay, all righty. So it's a combination of the ag and, and the communication and journalism, et cetera. 
<laughs> okay, that worked out. Do you want to make any kind? Any, then, then you continue. You were, was that a year uh, as the editor of the Exponent? And then I spent another year as the managing editor of the Exponent. So I graduated uh, in December of '74. Okay. Okay. The goal of being a uh, with, with you know remember this time period. This was all the Watergate time period. This was. Woodward and Bernstein and and uh, you know all of that. Sure. And uh, that was my that was my goal. I was going to topple governments. I was going to raise hell. I was going to win Pulitzer prizes. I was going to be the the next uh, Woodward and Bernstein. Okay. Mm. <laughs> interesting, right? Challenging and interesting, and with all with all different phases. <laughs> what uh, what happened then? What came next? Did you uh, after you graduated? Uh, actually, if I could just go back oh, for sir. a second and, and please do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, tie up some loose ends about my my stay at Purdue. Okay. My last two years at Purdue, Catherine, were basically focused on uh, getting the exponent out every day. I mean that that was uh, uh, academics uh, going to class uh, was secondary, and I was very very fortunate because I had professors in the political science department like Ken Kaufmel uh, and uh, Myron Hale. I had uh, uh, professors in communication uh, like Mark Diskin and uh, Steve Robb. I, I had this, uh, I had uh, uh, folks in, in I, I, had a, I had a direct personal relationship with uh, President uh, Hansen. Uh, he and I became quite close when I was there at Purdue and, and maintained a friendship that survives to uh, today. I had all these people who thought it was really, really important that, uh, unlike Dean Coles, that Purdue have uh, a good student newspaper. And uh, so while, uh, you know, I, I, I did graduate, I did get my bachelor's, and I graduated sort of on time in a sense, but uh, my primary focus the last a uh, couple of years was getting that newspaper out. Okay. Literally keeping the doors open. Right. And there's another whole history of the exponent that uh, is being written about what tough times uh, these were. I was also recruited into some organizations like Iron Key, uh, which proved to be a very good experience for me. Uh, um, ODK, Omicron Delta Kappa, the leadership uh, honorary, made some great friends uh, there. Um, Sigma Delta Chi, what was then, the, uh, now it's called the Society of Professional Journalists. It was called Sigma Delta Chi in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, uh, because I didn't have the ROTC scholarship anything, a anymore, two things happened. Uh, my folks, my dad retired from the Army, moved to Indiana, which made me qualified for in-state tuition. And uh, I got a full-ride Pulliam scholarship as uh, uh, the Pulliam family. You may or may not be aware of Dow scholarships. I think still does. Okay. And uh, there's another kind of irony uh, with that being the, the so-called radical editor of the Exponent uh, getting uh, a scholarship named after one of the most conservative uh, journalists in the history of journalism, journalism, Eugene uh, Pulliam. But that that uh, enabled me financially to get through. Sure, that's great. Well, they're the ones who were involved with the Star before it became Gannett. Am I, am I correct in that? The family who were involved with the Indianapolis Star? Absolutely right. Uh -huh. They were the owners. They were the family that owned the Star before yeah. they sold it to Gannett. Right, okay. So I graduated in December without a job and without much prospect of a job. I moved home, uh, worked construction for uh, a couple of months to get some uh, seed money to get out. And I literally uh, drove uh, east on I-70, start stopping at each and every city, uh, looking for a job in newspaper journalism, and finally was in the right place at the right time in February of uh, 1975, right? Yeah, to uh, get a job with the Hartford Times. Okay. It was the afternoon daily in Hartford, Connecticut. I was literally seated in the uh, outer office of the managing editor uh, when he fired somebody. Uh, I was sitting in the outer office listening to the shouting match between two men. I mean, expletives galore, and I finally heard the uh, uh, someone say, you can't fire me, you MF, I quit, outburst this guy, you know, out the storm, 
and out comes this big red-faced uh, Irishman uh, who was very, very angry, pointed at me and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> Introduced myself. I said I was looking for a job. He said, man, your timing is excellent. <laughs> I love that. Oh, wow. <laughs> right place at the right time, as they say, huh? <laughs> Uh, I worked at that paper for uh, only a few months when I uh, decided that uh, daily journalism probably wasn't for me. And so what, what you do then is you go back to school. And uh, in those days, uh, I, I had enough sense along the way to take the L LSAT. Uh, and um, I found myself admitted to uh, a four-year program in law and uh, political science at IU Bloomington to start in the uh, in September uh, of 1975 so my, my career as a journalist was was not very long lived and uh, so uh, I, 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 I uh, made arrangements rent an apartment and that it was ready I was already ready to start classes at Bloomington when I got a call from the head of the communication department at Purdue saying that they had had an instructor uh, who didn't show up. Uh, he literally didn't show up uh, for, for work. Uh, they were strapped. They needed somebody to uh, teach a couple of journalism courses and to act as the paid advisor to the uh, exponent, uh, the fac quote, faculty advisor. And I uh, could, they, they would admit me in any program, any graduate program uh, at Purdue that I wanted to be admitted into uh, full, you know, tuition paid and I would get a stipend and uh, all of a sudden it sounded like a really good idea to go back uh, for another year at Purdue so I, I spent uh, the academic year 75 76 back at Purdue uh -huh. uh, teaching I mean when you think of how preposterous it, 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 that is uh, that you know to be teaching journalism after the experience that I had had I mean, it, it really kind of spoke volumes, sadly, about, uh, the, you know, the sort of the Purdue journalism program hmm. uh, that, that, that they would think me capable of teaching. But the good news is I was able to get a year graduate school under my belt in American government and uh, political science and had a fabulously rich intellectual uh, year. I mean, it, 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 in a sense, this was my first opportunity to be a real student. Mm-hmm because the teaching stuff part of it was really not very uh, uh, difficult because it was just teaching basic journalism to these kids uh, who were only a couple of years uh, younger uh, than I. So sure. uh, that, that, that year I probably uh, was more uh, involved in uh, the academic uh, life of Purdue than I had in the preceding four years uh, combined. Mm -hmm. Um, while there, though, um, uh, I uh, studied with a, uh, um, uh, a political science professor who's still there by the name of Will McLaughlin. I'd taken a course from him as an undergraduate. I took a course from him as a graduate student. And he uh, and, and others in the political science department um, told me that if I really wanted to get involved in uh, uh, well, I left a critical part out of the story. If I really wanted to get involved in politics and, and, and government, I needed to go to Washington. If I was going to go to law school any place, it was at Georgetown, and that's where I needed to be. And here's the critical part of the story I admitted. In the fall of 1974, um, Senator Birch Bayh was running for re-election. And we asked him to come in to be interviewed by the exponent uh, in order to earn our... Uh, endorsement. I mean, if you can believe the hubris associated with a student newspaper. But I, I, I wanted the exponent to endorse uh, Birch by because he was the liberal and he was the Democrat, and that's, those were where my leanings were. But however, there were several kids on the exponent who were from Indianapolis and who admired greatly the mayor of Indianapolis, Dick Luger. So in 1974, it was Birch by versus Dick Luger. And they told me that, uh, you know, in order for the process to be fair, we had to invite both candidates in to be interviewed by us. So we did. We invited both of the candidates in. Dick Luger uh, came in first. 
he, he showed up at exactly the appointed time, stayed for exactly one hour, uh, you know, sat very, very professionally and endured our questions and did a great job. And the kids from Indianapolis looked at me and said, see, this guy has, you know, got something going for him. Oh, the next week, Birch Bayh showed up. He was running uh, 35 minutes late. Uh, he, uh, he insisted that instead of sitting in chairs, we sit on the floor. He took his coat off, loosened his tie, and proceeded to sit there for two and a half hours talking to us. Wow. While his staff assistant just went absolutely crazy trying to get him out of there. By the time the two and a half hours were over, of course, he had us eating out of his hand. This was the first exposure that I had had to Birch Bay. I told you I didn't grow up in Indiana. Sure. And so I knew him by name and reputation, but not at a personal level. And I will admit that during that, over that two and a half hours, I fell in love with the guy and would have gladly followed him to the ends of the earth. Well, he got the endorsement. Uh, and then when I was back at Purdue to, in graduate school in 75, 76 was when he geared up his presidential campaign. And I found myself traveling to Iowa and New Hampshire uh, in that fall and winter uh, supporting his presidential candidacy, which went nowhere mm -hmm. fall, unfortunately. But it established uh, my relationship with him and with uh, his staff. Uh, such that, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to go to Washington at some point sooner than later and work for him and ultimately did uh, go to Washington and uh, work for him and, and, uh, and went to law school at Georgetown in their evening program. Okay. So that's, how I, that's how I got to Washington. Okay, sounds good. And then um, what, what, was we, and then what happened after you received your law degree? What was next then? Well, I received my law degree in May of 1981, and uh, he was defeated in November of 80, so I still had a semester of law school to finish up, and um, by then I was also married, had a couple of children, uh, and that's another wonderful story of my life, but uh, we did, had to figure out where we wanted to live. We knew we, we uh, didn't want to stay in Washington because the Reagan Republicans had taken over Washington. It seemed like a very hostile place to us. My folks, as I mentioned, had moved to uh, Indiana after my dad's retirement from the Army. He went into business with an old Army buddy of his. He was from uh, Vermont. My mother was from uh, Cincinnati. There were no connections to Indiana uh -huh. or me. Okay. Anyway, it made sense, it made sense in our, uh, to us to uh, move to Indianapolis to raise our family. Uh, so I joined a law firm, uh, and not this, not the one I'm at now, but uh, another uh, fine law firm. Uh, and uh, so we moved to uh, Indianapolis in the uh, in May of 1981. Okay, okay. Um, I think the next thing I had on. Let's talk a little bit about your membership on the board of trustees. And let me start off by asking, how did the appointment come about? Well, uh, this is all it makes makes it will make sense to you sequentially. Uh, so in 1981, I was practicing law back here at, in, in Indiana, and uh, Senator Birch by called me and said, uh, you know my son Evan? Yes, of course, I've gotten to know his son Evan. Well, uh, Evan's thinking about coming back to Indiana. In fact, Evan did come back and, and campaign in 1984 for Wayne Townsend, who uh, was running for governor then, who, who ultimately went on the Purdue board himself. And Evan decided in 1985 to move uh, back to Indiana and practice law and begin his political career. And I helped him uh, in his first campaign for Secretary of State in 1986. I served as his chief of staff in the Secretary of State's office. I was his uh, transition director um, when he was elected governor in 1988. I was his first chief of staff and then legislative director. So. Uh, my appointment to the board was uh, by Governor By. Oh, okay, okay. Um, then uh, the first thing I was going to ask is the orientation. Do they have an orientation? Uh, what was what did that? And then some of the committees that you served on. And there was a, a, an orientation uh, process, uh, a, you know, where uh, uh, the uh, 
new board members are taken through uh, a basic understanding of how the university is, is organized. Now, that uh, process for me was kind of truncated because uh, Governor Bai appointed me shortly before the uh, first meeting that I needed to attend. Okay. In the spring would that have been or that fall? Was, uh, that was uh, in September of okay. 91. Okay. All right. Okay. Your, this, uh, for the researchers, I would just want to clarify, your appointment was a governor appointment, because some of the members, as you know, represent the alumni, but uh, I just wanted to put that in on the record then. What were some of the committees did you, that you served on? I, I, I served on the Academic Affairs Committee, I served on the Strategic Planning Committee, but I spent most of my time on the Finance Committee and uh, ultimately became the chair of the Finance Committee, and yeah. the Finance Committee uh, if, I, if I may say so, is an extremely important committee because uh, both kind of all facets of the financial uh, responsibilities of the university go through there, uh, tuition policy fees, uh, as well as the uh, uh, financing of uh, buildings. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it, it was uh, time-consuming but really really interesting fast all right and that brings up a couple of things that I had on there some of the the actions that they take such as the tuition and of course the budget the uh, operating and the capital budget and then construction is another you know big thing um, and then also the board approves appointments as well for deans and administrators etc um, am I correct in that you are right okay um, what about um, uh, the diversity. We usually ask that a little bit on that. Um. Well, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the, this was a time when uh, President Beering and then uh, ultimately President Jiski and, and uh, the leadership of the university and the deans uh, um, really emphasized uh, the need for, uh, for Purdue to do a better job at recruiting and retaining a diverse student body, uh, diverse faculty. Uh, there were there were considerable efforts. Uh, um, uh, this was a time. It's hard. It's hard to imagine that uh, in re in retrospect it took this long. But this was also the time when the university had to confront squarely its non-discrimination policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I wasn't deeply involved in uh, the drafting and implementation of. Uh, making the non-discrimination policy explicitly uh, include sexual orientation. Okay. And right. um, you know, of the many, many things that I was involved with at, at Purdue during that period of time, and that's one of which I'm uh, particularly proud. Yeah, good. That's good. Uh, there was also the capital improvement. That was a 10-year plan, uh, too, that was going on at that time. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. The board was involved in that. And then the, uh, of course, then the strategic plan came, you know, came next. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about, you served on as a member of the search committee for the uh, replacement for Dr. Baring. Uh, uh, one, of my proudest, uh, one of my proudest accomplishments. I hope that somehow that finds its way into my obituary. Uh, uh, for the researchers, um, might just make a comment, this is one of the most important actions that boards of trustees are involved in. Am I correct? Is that correct? Right. Okay. Uh, there's a whole body of literature, uh, I've read most of it, about the duties and responsibilities of uh, public university uh, boards of trustees. And uh, you can debate how much a, a board of trustees ought to be involved in this particular matter, or that appointment, or this contract, or that decision. Uh, but it is, it is indisputable that uh, it is, it is uh, solely the responsibility of the board of trustees to select the president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, the, the transition from uh, the Beering presidency to the Jiski presidency, the, the, the gearing up of the search process um, was, uh, was extremely well thought out because in, in some sense at a, at a university like Purdue, the process is almost as important as the outcome. Correct. Uh, in fact, there were Good point. I thought maybe that the process was going to overwhelm the outcome, but uh, uh, thanks to uh, the very strong leadership of Tim McGinley uh, during that period and, and to this day, um, 
both the process and the outcome of the uh, search uh, was, I think, very, very well handled. And I, I, I was just really, truly, uh, I say this with all the passion I can muster, uh, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Yeah, very nice comment, right. And then you had the student trustees that uh, were on there at that time. I think uh, uh, Jody uh, Banks was on there and um, another one was Julie. Um, we were trying to, we've been trying to, I've been trying to interview some of the student trustees and I was able to get Jill Steiner before she uh, terminates this time, so we'll hopefully get some of the others as well. Um, the, uh, after you um, stepped out uh, from the the board, what, what was the next step then? Did you return to go to the law firm or? Well, now you, know, you remember being a trustee isn't a full-time job or it's not supposed sure. to be a full-time job. Right. So uh, I, I, my, in terms of my career, I, okay. I went from uh, the uh, governor's office uh, in 91 back to the private practice of law. Okay. So I've been in the private practice of law uh, full-time since 1991. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, I'm now at a firm called Barnes and Thornburg, and I've been here since 2000. Okay, sounds good. Let's talk a little bit about your family. Did uh, any of your uh, children come to Purdue? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have three children and uh, a son and two daughters, and the birth order is son, daughter, daughter. And uh, our son uh, is our uh, only Purdue uh, alum. Uh, and uh, I must tell you that one of the highlights of my tenure as a, as a uh, trustee, indeed one of the highlights of my life, was to be able to literally hand our son his Purdue diploma. And there's a picture that's sitting on my desk that I'm looking at right now. Uh-huh. Oh, great. Me and my trustee garb and gown, and, uh, and it, it was really, really an incredible moment. In fact, the picture was taken by Jane Beering. Oh, okay. So it's very special. <laughs> Very good. Your, uh, did your other, did the daughters go to school in Indiana or? Uh, one went to uh, Davidson College in North Carolina and the other one went to Butler here in Indianapolis. Okay, sounds good. All right. Uh, have you participated, uh, being a graduate of Purdue, do you participate all in any, in, at all in any of the alumni activities or? I do. I okay. do. I'm certainly not nearly as active in Purdue matters as I was when I was on the board. But okay. Um, Quite recently, uh, I, I, I played a, a leadership role in um, a, a, the uh, uh, Boilermaker Ball that's held uh, here in Indianapolis in February. And so mm -hmm. I, I try to remain uh, active. Uh, you know, depending upon the uh, era, there are some Purdue alums who will always and forever remember me as the editor of the Exponent. <laughs> in fact, when my son was at Purdue, uh, he had one of my old professors and uh, he introduced himself to the professor and said that, uh, you know, my, my father remembers with such great fondness, um, uh, you know, you and, and, and the class. And, he's, and the professor says, by, by this time I've been on the board for several years, the, Purdue, the professor says, oh, yeah, he was uh, quite a firebrand editor of the exponent. I've kind of lost track of him. What's he up to? <laughs> What's he doing today, right? <laughs> Where is he at? <laughs> oh, uh, how about a? Um, do you have a Purdue tradition that's a favorite of yours that you'd like to share with us? I must tell you, uh, this is going to sound so hokey. And uh, nothing is hokey in this in this day and age. Uh, it's reminiscences. And I've been, and I will follow up, and that's nice because I've also interviewed Roy Johnson too, uh, who does that. I tell Roy that uh, even at my most uh, radical times as a as a student, I think it's a product of probably being an army brat. <laughs> uh, that uh, they, they, this, that at the start of football games is just an, uh, something very very special. Yeah. Do you still come for all the games, or try to come for them? I only come to as many as I, I, sure. I do, and, and certainly I do a couple of football games uh, a year, a couple of basketball games, but uh, my the, uh, trustee time uh, has been consumed now with other, uh, other activities. Sure, I understand. Um, how about an outstanding event? Do you have one that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think I already have. I okay. Just, uh, the uh, event that I consider to be the, the most uh, memorable 
it was awarding uh, uh, our son uh, his Purdue uh, diploma. Now, do you mean events, uh, generally speaking? I don't know. There's so many wonderful uh, Purdue. I, 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 I can I'll tell you another event. Good. Out of my mind. Um, but the, there was a, PBS did a documentary on Amelia Earhart. Right. And, uh, of course, spent a lot of time in the archives and actually had the unveiling of the, uh, uh, of the documentary at Purdue. And I was on the board then, and uh, our older daughter, uh, who was then maybe fifth or sixth grade, something like that, had just gotten crazy about Amelia Earhart. So I invited her to, to go uh, with me. So, uh, you know, they do the uh, uh, thing, and then there's a question and answer. And, and, um, and uh, the, the, the uh, producer's up there on the stage at the microphone pointing down I think pointing at me, saying, "Yes, do you have a question?" And the next thing I know, I you know, I, I feel this 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 person stand up next to me. It's my 11 year old daughter <laughs> standing up and asking, actually challenging them on a fact point about. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> wow. I was so proud of her. Oh, that's great. We yeah. thought that was the neatest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm, before we close, and I'm going to ask some closing remarks, a little bit at the beginning, uh, I had a little technical problem. So if you just if you just review where you were born and just a little bit about your parents, um, just to be sure that we get on the tape. And then in closing, any uh, closing remarks that you'd like to make. Okay, Bill? I was born September 9, 1952 in Fort Carson, Colorado. Uh, my father, uh, who still lives, is Donald William Morrow Sr., uh, who was a uh, Vermont and New Englander, and uh, my mother, uh, who passed away in 1992, is Shirley May Thompson uh, Morrow, um, who uh, who was a Cincinnati girl. Okay, good. Then, uh, then we talked about high school. That's okay. And then, any closing? I'll leave it up to you. What you'd like to uh, in closing? I'll leave, any comments that you'd like to make? Uh, well. I guess I, I would just say this in closing. At, 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 uh, at my age, I'm going to be 57 in, in September. Uh, you you uh, start uh, necessarily to look, kind of look back at your life and what you've accomplished <laughs> and with your life. And you look at the things that have influenced your life. Um, my decision to go to Purdue, uh, my decision to go back to Purdue after really kind of deciding to go uh, transfer to Northwestern. Uh, the uh, impact that uh, people, uh, some of whom I've named and some of whom I haven't, and so I will try to name them now, the impact of Purdue people like Dave Fendler, like uh, Art Hansen, like Bob Ringel, God rest his soul, uh, Bev Stone, God rest her soul, Barb Cook, uh, the influence of Purdue people like, and in, in my later uh, years, uh, Steve Beering, and uh, Mark Chisky. Uh, the, the influence of Purdue uh, upon my life is, is so profound, immeasurable, um, difficult to calculate. I guess I'd leave it at that. Okay, that's good. I want to um, I want to thank you very much, Bill Murrow, for uh, the opportunity to interview you for the program, and I and I thank you very much. And I want to wish you the very best. And I hope on a visit to campus we can uh, touch base and maybe have coffee or even lunch. I'd like that, okay. Catherine. And I do apologize for the on again, off again. No. I guess you'll send me a transcript. Yes, I will. It'll be coming in a little bit of time, but we will send that for you to look over before we add it to the uh, our website. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. <clears throat>